good evening beautiful uh, welcome to the young scientist round table this is the first session for the school year uh, you already have some information about the next two sessions i just want to make sure that you all know that typically we hold young scientist round table at this location but the next one is an exception it is going to be held at wayzata high school we have got a speaker coming from cornell university it is going to be another phenomenal presentation there and uh, just make sure that you are coming to the wayzata high school and not to this location for the uh, event on november 2nd well we do have another very interesting topic to discuss um, our speaker tonight is dr mark wilchinski he is an orthopedic surgeon specialized in hand and upper extremity he attended the university of chicago where he earned where he earned a ba in anthropology and ma in social sciences he then matriculated at the medical college of wisconsin where he earned an md following medical school he completed an orthopedic residency at emory university remaining true to his interests he subsequently completed his hand and upper extremity fellowship at the barnes jewish hospital at washington university in st louis he is currently a surgeon at tria orthopedic center in bloomington uh, about a year ago i had an opportunity to meet with dr wilchinski and i was really impressed of his skill in explaining the complex medical concept in an entertaining way then i thought about you i said if he can entertain me i'm sure he'll be entertaining you so that's the reason he is here today and he'll be talking on the subject of nerve function science and carpal tunnel dr wilchinski thanks for the introduction my name is mark wilchinski i'm i'm a hand sorry i'm I'm a hand surgeon here in the Twin Cities. So bef before we get started, I just want to get an idea of ages. So who here is in elementary school? Okay. Who's in middle school? And who's in high school? Okay. Excellent. So if there are any questions anywhere throughout the talk and something doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and stop me and we can back it up, okay? I, I really want to make sure you understand everything. So. How many of you know what a cell is? Most people. So a cell is the smallest living unit in your body. It's the, it's, the, it's the building block that your body is made out of. And when we talk, and there are different kinds of cells for different kinds of tissues in your body. In nerve, the cell is called a neuron. And these are cells that transmit information to other cells, to muscle, and to gland tissue. These are the cells, these are the parts of your body that make your muscles contract so they let you move. And these are the parts of your body that transmit a signal to your brain that tell you that this is a smooth surface and it's kind of cold. So they're basically the wires in your body. So there are four parts to a neuron. So the, the main central part right here is called the cell body. And this is like the factory of the cell. So the cell body is where everything is made. They make all the protein that the cell needs, anything that the cell needs comes from the cell body. So this is where RNA and protein are made. Then there are these other things that kind of these little uh, extensions or arms that come off the cell, which are called dendrites. And these are um, little, basically little appendages that allow nerve cells to communicate with nerve cells. These are like like the social media of, of, of a nerve. They, they communicate back, they allow nerves to communicate with nerves. Then the axon is this long projection right here. And this is the part of the nerve that carries the signal. So this is really the wire part of the, of the nerve. Each nerve has one axon. So there is one cell body for one axon. And some nerve fibers are coated. They've got an insulation around it with something called myelin, and others don't. They're, they carry signals in both directions. So they carry signals from the brain distally, and they carry signals in the opposite direction. 
So from the brain distally, those are, those are signals that tell your muscles to contract and cause you to move. And then the signals in the opposite direction are, this, are sensory. Sens do you have a question? Okay. And then there are, there are, uh, are, and then the opposite direction is sensory. And then the last part of the nerve is called the presynaptic terminal. So it's the end of the axon. So when the axon gets to the very end, it's got to figure out a way. It needs an appendage that allows it to transmit its signal to whatever comes next. And um, sometimes it's muscle, sometimes it's another nerve. And it does that through this appendage called the presynaptic terminal. And housed in the presynaptic terminal are these little bubbles that are filled with a special chemical that your body makes called um, uh, nerve transmitters. And basically, they are chemicals that um, transmit the electrical impulse of the nerve into a chemical impulse and send the signal down the chain. So I, I think when, it's in, when we talk about nerves, it's important to, to talk about nerves in two ways. They, they conduct information, they, and they do this via electrical signals and chemical signals. So electrical signaling, this is probably the most when people think of nerves, this is usually what they think of. They think of them as the wiring in your body that sends signals from point A to point B. And um, most of the nerves that we're gonna talk about are nerves that conduct signals at a very high rate of speed. And the reason that they're able to do this is that they're insulated. So just like a wire at home that you plug into the wall or this wire here connected to the computer, there's a wrapping around the nerve, and part of the reason that there are wrapping around the wire, and part of the reason that there's, there's a wrapping around it is it helps to uh, insulate the wire and improve the conductivity of the wire, the speed at which the wire can conduct a signal. And for each one of these axons, there are hundreds of Schwann cells, or hundreds of these little myelin cells. So the myelin cells are called Schwann cells, and they kind of wrap themselves around the nerve kind of like if you ever seen those, those little hot dogs that have crescent rolls around them, kind of like that. And all along the axon, there are all of, these, all of these myelin cells that wrap around the nerve. And the myelin helps to increase the rate at which the, the nerve can conduct a signal. And the reason that it does that is because it allows the, the signal to jump from um, one exposed axon space to the other. So basically, it the signal can jump over the places that the myelin wraps around the nerve. And this results in a phen phenomenon called saltatory conduction. Saltatory means jumping. So it jumps from, from uh, one, this is called a node of Ranvier. So the space between the myelin is called a, a myelin is called a node of Ranvier and the signal can jump from space to space. And that increases the speed at which the nerve can conduct a signal. So you know, how does it do this? How, how does the nerve conduct a signal? How can it produce an electrical signal? So the way that it, it does this is the, the nerve axon will actually set up an active gradient. So, on, so outside of the cell, there is a lot of potassium. On the inside, excuse me, outside the cell, there's a lot of sodium. And inside the cell, there is a lot of potassium. And what that does is it creates a gradient across the cell membrane. Does that make sense to everybody? Probably not. So, so basically there's, there is um, a membrane and on one side of it there is a lot of potassium and on the other side of it there is a lot of sodium. And that doesn't just happen by chance. So your, your nerve cells preferentially position the potassium and the sodium on opposite sides of the nerve cell. And what this does is it creates a um, uh, electrical potential across the cell membrane. And then something activates the nerve. And when it activates the nerve, uh, basically what it does, we'll come to this in a second, is that it allows all the sodium outside the cell to come in and then it propagates itself down the axon. And as the sodium comes in, the next step is that the potassium goes out of the cell. And then 
as this propagates down the axon back here, there are active pumps to reestablish the balance between the sodium and the potassium. Does that kind of make sense? So this is basically a very complicated process that involves um, uh, uh, basically asymmetry of ions across the cell membrane. And then when that signal gets down to the very end, to the very end, you get to this presynaptic terminal. And that's when this electrical signal that's been carried down the nerve cell is converted into a chemical signal, and it causes the release of these neurotransmitters that come down to the cell membrane, and then they're released into this space. In this case, it's between the, the nerve cell and the muscle. And then these neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the muscle. They, they connect to the muscle, and they tell the muscle to contract. And then your muscle will flex, and it'll cause you to move. So you might be asking yourself, well, how do these nerve transmitters make their way to the, to the presynaptic terminal? And so as you recall from earlier, the, the cell body is the manufacturing center for the cell. That's where all of these proteins, excuse me, all of these proteins and neurotransmitters are created. And then there are delivery mechanisms that will deliver the nerve transmitters all the way down to the presynaptic terminal. And then it brings the waste products back in the opposite direction to the cell body where they can again be processed and eliminated from the neuron. And so this, there are two different ways that this, this transportation happens, where this chemical signaling happens. There are slow pathways, and so this is basically happening at about four millimeters a day, and these are kind of structural elements of the cell that help to, to uh, uh, maintain this very long axon, axon. And then there are fast, there are fast uh, transportation mechanisms, and the fast ones require energy. Does everyone know what ATP is? That means energy. It means that this is an active process, and it requires um, uh, a source of energy for it to happen. And this happens quite a bit faster, so it happens at about 400 millimeters a day in both directions. So, and traveling away from the cell body are these neurotransmitters that make it back to the, um, that make it to the presynaptic terminal, and then traveling back in the opposite direction are all the waste products. How many of you have had chicken pox? Couple people? How many people have had shingles? Way in the back. Yeah, shingles, yeah. So um, the chicken pox virus is called herpes zoster, okay? And so once you're infected with the chicken pox virus, it always lives in your body. It always lives in your nerve cells. And so what happens is these, these um, herpes zoster viruses enter the cell at the presynaptic terminal, and then the same mechanism of fast transport, but in a retrograde or backward fashion, bring that chicken pox virus into the cell body. And then it just kind of lays dormant there. It just takes a nap and does nothing. And then all of a sudden, one day it wakes up, and you can end up with, a, with kind of a secondary form of chicken pox, which is called shingles or zoster, and it can be very uh, painful. But this is just an interesting side note that, that that's how that's how shingles happens as well. That's how your body stores these viruses. So um, this is kind of a summary of that chemical signaling or axonal transport. There's the fast method, which flows from the cell body outward and then from the presynaptic terminal back to the cell body. It requires energy to do it. And so basically what we're talking about here are proteins and, neuro and uh, neurotransmitters. And then the slow axonal transport is more, is, is more, is, does not require energy and uh, is basically to maintain the skeletal system of the cell. So just to reiterate, neurons are responsible for the flow of information and much of it is via electrical signaling, but there's also this chemical signaling that happens as well. So a little bit about nerve anatomy. So 
remember we talked about the, the neuron is the building block of the nerve, and then the axon is the part that conducts the signal. So each nerve is made up of millions of these little axons, okay? And those axons are all wrapped in myelin. So here you can see that myelin wrap that allows them to conduct their, their signal at a faster rate. And then each one of these <coughs> uh, little axons are wrapped around by uh, uh, some connective tissue, which is called the endoneurium, this red thing. So that's the endoneurium. And then all of these little fascicles wrapped in endoneurium come together to form a, a bigger structure, which is also wrapped in this green connective tissue, which is called perineurium. And when these axons come together like this, we call them fascicles. And then all of these fascicles wrapped in perineurium come together to form the nerve. And then the nerve is wrapped in a fibrous sheath called the epineurium. So nerve, like every other tissue in your body, is, is alive. And so what happens, what, what is it called if your heart doesn't get any blood? It's called a heart attack, right? And so your heart needs to get blood, and your nerves need to get blood too. So, so there is a blood supply to your nerve, and some of it runs on the outside of the nerve, and then there's, there are other parts that run on the inside of the nerve. So there's external or epineurial blood flow. So remember the epineurium, epineurium is the purple part. Um, and then there's internal blood flow, which is the peri and endoneurium. So what ha so the, these are very, very small blood vessels. Normal blood pressure is about 120 over 80 or so. And by the time you get down to these small, tiny little capillaries, the pressure inside might only be 30 to 10 millimeters of mercury. So very, very little pressure to get this fluid, this blood, to flow through the blood, the blood vessels. So it doesn't require a lot of, it does not require a lot of um, pressure or compression of the nerve to cause those little blood vessels just to close down. Does that kind of make sense? So if the pressure around the nerve is higher than the capillary filling pressure, those little tiny blood vessels will, will close off. And when those little tiny blood pressure, those little tiny blood vessels close off, it results in ischemia, which is fancy term for basically the, the nerve isn't getting enough oxygen anymore. So if you increase the pressure alone, it alters both that, both that fast and slow axonal transport. And then uh, ischemia, excuse me, if you increase the pressure, this is a typo, it alters the fast axonal transport. And if it's ischemia, so if it's, if it's limited blood flow as well, then it alters both fast and slow axonal transport. So this is what a compressed nerve looks like. So this is a nerve in your body. This is in the operating room. So the nerve kind of looks like a white cord. And this is kind of normal looking nerve up here. You see how it's kind of white and shiny. And this is pretty normal looking nerve down here. It's also kind of white and shiny. And then this part in between where it's really red, that's what a compressed nerve looks like. And I think you can see that, it, yeah, go ahead. This thing? This, this thing right here? Oh, you can't see it. it the, the red thing, on, I'm sorry, I've been using my pointer and, and uh, you can't see it. The red thing on the right side of the screen, it's called a vessel loop. It's just a little piece of rubber that you can put around the nerve to kind of gently move it around a little bit. And the, the blue one is the same thing. It's also called a vessel loop. They're different colors for different sizes. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is uh, basically your ulnar nerve. So this is a nerve up around your elbow. Yeah. What's the yellow stuff? You mean the stuff kind of at the bottom of the screen? Is that what you're talking about? That's fat. <laughs> what else? Other, another question. What's the white thing on the side over there to the left side of the screen? That's, we, it's called a sponge. It just, it just absorbs extra blood if there's blood. 
Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Either one. What are the black things at the top? Those, they're actually purple. Those are veins. Yeah. Did you have a question too? Okay. But so this is, so this is kind of what a, a compressed nerve looks like. So it's, it's red, it's angry. If you look at it, it's kind of hourglass shaped. And so you can imagine that if you have a nerve like that, how it would limit the blood flow to the, to the nerve and that limited blood flow is then going to result in ischemia and these axons that we've been talking about can't really conduct a signal anymore nor can they transmit these chemicals down, down the axon that, that allow them to conduct a signal. And so when we talk about nerve compression and nerve injuries there are different classifications and I don't think it's worth getting weighted down in what the different classifications are but basically if you look at the top this is it, it, it ranges from where just the axon is affected, and then as you get all the way down to the bottom, the axon, the perineur, and everything outward to the perineurium is basically affected. So the bottom would represent a nerve that's been cut, for example, and then all of the stuff on top would represent a nerve that maybe is severely compressed or it's been stretched or it's been injured in some other way. Does that kind of make sense? So there are different grades of nerve injuries. So when we talk about nerve compression, we talk about acute and chronic. So has it been there for a long time? Has it been there for a short period of time? So how many of you have hit your funny bone? You've all hit your funny bone, right? So your funny bone, do you think your funny bone is a nerve? It, it, it's a, your, your, excuse me, is your funny bone a bone? I gave away the answer, it's a nerve. So your funny bone is actually a nerve. And so when you hit it, really, and you strike it against something, that's kind of an acute, fast compression, meaning it happened all of a sudden, right? And it just happened for a short period of time. And then there are chronic problems, which means that there's been pressure on this nerve for a long time. It's slowly built up, and it's just been lingering, and it doesn't go away. And nerves are able to tolerate greater magnitudes of compression when the force is applied gradually. So if you hit your funny bone really, really hard, it can make that nerve irritable for a long, long time. It doesn't tolerate that very well. But if the pressure on that nerve gradually builds up, so if you push on it just a little bit for a long period of time, the nerve accommodates to that and it tolerates it better. So when a nerve is compressed, when a nerve gets pinched, it undergoes a, a cascade of changes. And I, again, I don't think it's worth getting bogged down in all of the details of this of this table but the end result is that the nerve stops working properly and when the nerve stops working properly you end up with what do nerves do again they do two things right they give you sensation so they help you to feel things and they allow you to move they have motor functions so when a nerve doesn't work right what happens motor function that's a good question he asked what does motor function mean it means making your muscles move which makes your arm move. So when your muscle contracts, your arm moves. Does that make sense? Another question? You wanna think about it? Okay. So when, so when a nerve stops working, you lose those two things. Usually sensory, your ability to feel things is affected before your ability to move muscles. So why is this relevant? Why, why does this matter kind of in everyday terms other than it's, it's kind of interesting to know how these nerves in your body work? And it's because there are lots of medical problems that are uh, related to compressed nerves and probably the most common one that I deal with is called carpal tunnel syndrome. So how many parents in the audience have had carpal tunnel syndrome? Lots of people. So carpal tunnel syndrome is a pinched or compressed nerve as it crosses your wrist, okay? So the carpal tunnel is right about here. It's right, it's right at the base of your hand. And so it's, it's a space in the palm and the borders are bone. So the back of it is, are all of your wrist bones 
and the roof is a really thick band of tissue called the transverse carpal ligament. So it's, it's a tube. I think you can see that it really is a tube. And then running through the tube are the tendons that let you make your hand into a fist. So the tendons on that picture are the black dots, okay? And then there is one nerve, and it's called the median nerve. And that median nerve is what's compressed in carpal tunnel syndrome. So the pressure goes up inside of this closed tube. It compresses the tendons and the nerve. The tendons don't really care. They keep doing what they're supposed to do, which is work with muscles to help you move your fingers. But the nerve gets irritable. It doesn't work well because it's being pinched. And the end result is that you get hand numbness, tingling, pain, and loss of function. And it's all caused because this nerve is being compressed. So it's pretty common. It happens a lot. It happens mostly in women. The incidence, increase, it, it, the incidence increases um, as we get older. It is a common operation in the United States. It's one of the 10 most common operations in the United States. And this is kind of old data. It's from 1995, but it's expensive. If you, talk about, if you talk about all the people in 1995 that were treated for carpal tunnel syndrome, it had about a $2 billion in impact on the economy, so it's expensive. So why does it happen? We talked about this a little bit. It's because the pressure in the carpal tunnel goes up, and then the pressure causes the median nerve to become ischemic, so it loses blood flow. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Could be if you sleep on it funny and you kind of put pressure on your nerve and you wake up and your hand or your arm feels funny, that's usually what happens. And then as you move, the pressure goes off, comes off the nerve and it gradually gets more blood. And then as it does, you get all that funny kind of pins and needles sensation and then that finally goes away. Yep, yep, so that's probably your nerve, yeah. Yep. So he asked, is that why your leg falls asleep? And that's, that is why it falls asleep. So it's not because you're cutting off blood flow to your whole leg. You're just putting pressure on a nerve and the blood flow is cut off to the nerve and then the nerve doesn't like that. So it starts acting irritable, which is why you get that numbness and tingling sensation. Yes. The median nerve. So the median nerve is this nerve that's in the carpal tunnel that gets pinched. It's just one nerve. So when the nerves are in your arm, there are a bunch of different nerves and we give them names so we know which one we're talking about. And this one is called the median nerve. Any, anybody else? Okay. So um, the result of all of this pressure is that the nerve just doesn't conduct a signal very well anymore. And then if the pressure is on, on a nerve for long enough and high enough, then it can start to cause permanent damage to the nerve. So the nerve just starts to die, what people would call permanent nerve damage. So why do people get it? Women are, as I said, are more likely get, to get it than men. We were talking about this in the, in the back room that um, if you have a first degree female relative who's got carpal tunnel syndrome and you're a woman, you have a sevenfold increased risk of getting it yourself. And then there has been some research about the shape of the carpal tunnel, and there seems to be maybe some loose affiliation with the shape of the carpal tunnel and the development of carpal tunnel syndrome. There are some other health problems that are very common in, di or in um, carpal tunnel syndrome. How many, how many women in here had it when they were pregnant? Nobody? You did? It's, it's very common. It usually resolves after pregnancy. Diabetics get it more frequently than others. Inflammatory arthritis, so these are things like rheumatoid arthritis, kidney failure, hypothyroidism, and then it can happen after an injury. So if you, if you break your wrist, you can get a, an acute carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a, anybody can answer this, adults and kids, but keyboard use can cause carpal tunnel syndrome. Is this true or is it false? Let, how many people think it's true? And, and how many people think it's false? So the trues win. The tr there were more trues than falses by, by, quite a, by quite a bit. But 
the trues were wrong. It's false. <laughs> yeah. So, so carpal tunnel syndrome is not caused by keyboarding and, and um, uh, mouse use. There have been studies that have looked at the rate of carpal tunnel syndrome in people who type and use computers and those who do not, and the rate of developing carpal tunnel syndrome is no different in the two populations. Yes? Um, how many jobs have been changed Yeah, I mean, there's probably a little bit of truth for that. If when your fingers move, it improves the blood flow around the nerve, so that's a good thing for these problems. So there's, so there's never been a direct relationship between repetitive work activities and carpal tunnel syndrome. So the, the concept that carpal tunnel syndrome is occupationally or exertional, uh, exertionally related is, is somewhat controversial. Um, there's no study that has proven that work or just use of your hands causes carpal tunnel syndrome, but the use of high vibration tools can cause carpal tunnel syndrome. So I'm talking about things like a jackhammer or heavy machinery. And there does seem to be some association with work that requires repetitive gripping activities. Yeah. It's probably not enough. Yeah, that's probably not enough vibration. Yeah, but that's, that's, he asked, does, what about your phone vibrating in your hands? Do you get a lot of phone calls? Okay, so how do we make this diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome? So carpal tunnel syndrome, first and foremost, is numbness and tingling in your hands. So it's, you, the hands and the fingers feel really numb and tingly. Most people will tell you it happens at night. So they'll, most of my patients will say, I cannot get a good sleep at night. I wake up several times. My hand is numb and tingly. It drives me crazy. It can happen during the daytime with provocative activity. So we talked about things that require grip seem to maybe activate it some. So adults will say, I'm driving the car and my hands get numb and tingly. Um, or I have to, a job where I have to grip something and, and my hands get numb and tingly. Usually the numbness and the tingling is in your thumb, your index, your long finger, and then half of your ring finger. So remember we talked about these nerves that travel down your arm and then they branch and they end in these presynaptic terminals. And so those, the nerve distribution where a nerve ends is predefined. It's not kind of a random event. And this media nerve that's in the carpal tunnel is responsible for those, that part of your hand. Yes? The dark part, so he asked, what's the dark part? And the dark part is just to show which fingers get numb and tingly in carpal tunnel syndrome. Oh, that's just, that's just kind of fancy shading stuff. Yes. You, your thumb to your pinky when you, at night when you sleep? Yeah, it's probably there. So there's another nerve. We talked about your funny bone is your ulnar nerve, right? So that also crosses your wrist and it's responsible for giving you sensation to the rest of your hand, so the pink part up on the screen. And when, when, you're, uh, when it happens, you're probably squishing that nerve a little bit too. Yes? So he asked, is carpal tunnel syndrome similar to trigger finger? That's a, that is a very smart question. So. Um, it's similar in some ways, okay? So remember, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Okay, here. So remember we talked about the carpal tunnel as a tube, right? And so on the, on the floor of the carpal tunnel are your wrist bones and the top of the carpal tunnel is um, this, this band of tissue called the transverse carpal ligament and the pressure in the tube goes up. So a trigger finger is a problem that happens out here in your hand. Have any adults had trigger finger in here? You've had trigger finger? You've had trigger finger? Yeah, so trigger finger is this ph phenomenon that happens where um, your finger kind of gets stuck down something like this, and then 
all of a sudden you can generate, you, you have a really hard time getting it straight, but you can generate enough tension that you can get it to pop straight, but it doesn't move smoothly. It just, it just, um, it kind of opens up with a jerk. And it's a similar problem in the sense that it's a tendon that's getting stuck in a tube, okay? So the tube that it's in is like this. The floor is bone and the roof is fi thick fibrous connective tissue. And it turns into a size mismatch problem. So, you know, think about your belt going through your belt loop, okay? So your belt is like a ten is the tendon that glides back and forth. And the loop of the belt is the, um, that fibrous tissue that the tendon has to glide through. So normally you can take your belt and you can just shift it back and forth and it travels fine without it getting stuck. But now imagine you took your belt and you tied it in a knot and then you tried to get it to go underneath the belt loop. It's not gonna go through very well anymore, right? It's kinda gonna get stuck. And that's, that's kind of like what happens in trigger finger. You have a thick nodule in your tendon and that nodule then can't make it through a tube similar to this and it causes the finger to catch and pop. And, and interestingly, there's a very high uh, incidence of trigger fingers in carpal tunnel syndrome. About 8% of people with carpal tunnel syndrome have trigger finger at the same time. Does that answer the question? So, s s very similar. Slightly different problem, but very similar. All right, so where were we? Okay, so remember nerves do two things. So they're sense, they give you sensory, and then they give you um, motor function. They, they help you to contract your muscles and move. And so many people with carpal tunnel syndrome will first complain of numbness and tingling. So their sensory, at, the sensory parts of their nerve are affected first, and then later they'll say that their, their muscles, their hands don't work very well, they feel like they drop things, and, the, and that's, that's the motor part or the muscle part of the nerve that starts to fail later. And if it goes on for a really long time, you can start, the, the muscles um, can start to fade away because they're not getting enough of a signal. And if you look at the picture on the left side of the screen, it's not super clear, but basically, what it's supposed to show is that there's a muscle group on the side of the thumb here that's kind of shrunken up and shriveled up a little bit because the nerve is no longer working well and sending it a signal. What about the picture on the right? That's just a way to test, that's an exam, uh, and that's a way to test some of the muscle strength in the hand. So how do we, so how do we test this? So how do you, how can you objectively measure somebody's sensation? So for the kids, what that means is how can I measure in a reproducible way how well somebody feels? It's kind of hard, right? You might tell me that you feel numb or tingly, but how do I measure that and, and say, okay, um, your ability to feel things is, is compromised, and how do I measure it in a way that I can, I can reproduce down the road and tell you whether or not things seem to be getting better or worse? And so one way to do this is to um, do something which is called two-point discrimination. So this is a, basically just a caliper, and we'll, we will touch your finger with it with either one of the points or two of the points, and we'll make the points wider until you're able to tell me that it's two points instead of one point. And we can go back and measure that over and over and over again to tell you if things are improving. And then there are these provocative tests. So when your nerve is irritable and it's compressed, it will, remember we showed how it conducts a signal. If it's irritable because it's compressed, it doesn't take as much stimulus to cause it to, to fire, to cause the nerve to fire. So if you tap over the nerve at the carpal tunnel, you'll get these electrical sensations that pass into your fingers, and it's because you're stimulating the nerve. Probably the kids won't get it, but some adults, if you bend your wrist down like this, if you let gravity pull your wrist down, what it actually does is kink off the nerve, and so you're not getting much blood to it, and, the, and you'll start to feel numb and tingly. And then you can kind of take that one step further where you can kink off the nerve and pinch it between your fingers, and that'll make the hand get numb and tingly too. So these are just things that we can do to try to confirm a diagnosis. 
And then last but not least, there are these things called electrical studies, which we'll talk about more in part two. So our decision to treat is, is based upon many factors, including how did it happen, how long has it been there, how bad are the symptoms. So is your ability to tell me, um, uh, is your ability to tell me one versus two very compromised? Is there muscle weakness and, and atrophy? And then also, what does the patient want? So many times we can treat carpal tunnel syndrome without surgery, and this is appropriate in the absence of, of objective nerve dysfunction. So what that means for all the kids is it's appropriate if there isn't any sign of nerve, permanent nerve damage. So what it means is you feel like it's numb and tingly, but all of the measurements on exam are fall within normal limits. And then, um, so medications, are there medications that work? Not really. There is some interest in use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are things like ibuprofen and Aleve, and they haven't shown any difference in um, uh, affecting the outcome of carpal tunnel syndrome. There is some interest in vitamin B6. B6 is important in nerve physiology and some of the processes we talked about earlier. That hasn't shown to make any difference. Probably the most effective non-operative treatment is to wear a splint and, and hold the wrist in a neutral position. Remember we talked about if you bend your wrist down like this, it kinks off the nerve, and that's meant to just keep your wrist in kind of a neutral position. Sometimes we inject the carpal tunnel, so sometimes we put cortisone in the carpal tunnel. Cortisone tends to help carpal tunnel syndrome for a few months, but for most patients it's not a very good long-term solution. It just comes back. And then when everything else fails, there is surgery, so you can do carpal tunnel surgery. And so if you recall, we talked about carpal tunnel syndrome being a nerve compression problem. The surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome is a nerve decompression surgery. So we take that space, that tube, and we open it up. The, if you recall from that first picture, the roof is that thick band of tissue called the transverse carpal ligament. And all we do in carpal tunnel surgery is divide, is divide that ligament. And then that's what's been done in the picture on the right. And what you see kind of at the bottom of the wound is the median nerve. So in terms of, there are a lot of people that present with bilateral carpal, oh yeah, in the back. Sure. So re repeat the last part, because I, I kind of lost you after preventative. Yeah. Yeah, so ba basically the, the question is, if there is someone that has carpal tunnel syndrome or is, or is apt to develop it because they have one of these coexisting conditions, is there anything preventative that you can do to try to prevent yourself from developing carpal tunnel syndrome? And the answer to that is probably not. There aren't any real um, oral medications that you can take. Um, there are exercises called nerve glides, which may help to improve the blood flow to the nerve, but there aren't really any sort of oral medications or vitamins that will make a difference. Um, Splinting long, splinting long term isn't a very tenable solution, so there aren't many preventable things you can do. About 70% of people who develop symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome during their lifetime will end up having surgery for it at some point in time. So what, what that tells you is that for most people it's a progressive problem, it gets worse with time, and there's not a lot that you can do to prevent that from happening. Yes, go ahead. Is there anything is so is there anything that you can do maybe as a kid that would keep you from getting it as an adult? And there we don't know of anything. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so question number one, he had two questions. The first one is, 
after you recover from the surgery, do you get back to normal? Can you do everything that you were doing before? And the answer is yes. So after the surgery, there are, so we would limit your activity. We just make, keep it really light for about a month. And then after a month, you can go back and do anything that you want to do. But many patients have a little tenderness over their incision that lasts about three to six months. And then the second question is, kind of, is there a, is, do you have to do anything special as you're recovering from surgery? Some basic range of motion exercises, that's about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good, so that's another good question. So, so his question is, if you have surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome, in, in effect, what he's really asking is, is it, can it come back? If you have surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome, can it come back if you still do things like bend your wrist down or squeeze things? And the answer to that is rarely, less than a percent of the time does it come back. So once you've opened up the space, once you've made the carpal tunnel open, it tends to, imp it tends to improve the blood flow to the nerve permanently. Yes? Um, so can you? So do so do pay? Can you get it just on one side, or do you always get it on both sides? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. So a lot. So you, there are. Just because you get it on one side doesn't mean you're going to get it on the other side, but there are a lot of people who've got car bilateral or carpal tunnel syndrome that affects both sides. Sometimes it's at the same time. Sometimes they have carpal tunnel syndrome on one side and then five years down the road, they start to develop symptoms on the, on the opposite side. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's really not any minimum age. It's kind of an unusual problem for a kid to develop, but it's, it wouldn't be uh, unheard of. Um, the kind of the peak age is about 55. So it's usually a problem that starts to affect people sort of in the, the, the middle of their life or a little after that. Yes. There is, so the question is, are there any other problems or syndromes that are similar to carpal tunnel syndrome? And there are, there are a lot of them. So carpal tunnel syndrome is, is, is a compressed nerve. So it's, it's basically just a pinched nerve. Have you heard of people say that they have a pinched nerve in their neck maybe? So you can have a pinched nerve in your neck. And then there are other places in your arm that nerves can get pinched. It can happen behind your elbow, your funny bone, which is called cubital tunnel syndrome. There are other nerves called the radial nerve that can get pinched as it goes across your arm called PIN syndrome or radial tunnel syndrome. There is another, this media nerve that gets pinched at the wrist for carpal tunnel. Rarely it can get pinched up by your elbow which is called pronator syndrome. And then there are other places in your, in your legs and your feet where nerves can get pinched too. Yes. Can kids get carpal tunnel syndrome? It would be pretty strange if, if a kid got carpal tunnel syndrome. It's not impossible, but it doesn't happen a lot. Okay? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, does it ever fix itself, or does it always lead to surgery? So, um, sorry. So. But, so as we said earlier, about 70% of people who develop carpal tunnel syndrome will end up having surgery for it in their lifetime. So there are about 30% of people who don't. And so, you know, the interpretation of that data is that either the symptoms don't progress to a point that are bad, that's bad enough that they want to have surgery, or their symptoms regress and they feel, and they feel better. There are, is a special subset of the population where the symptoms do tend to get better with time, 
and that's in pregnancy. So carpal tunnel syndrome is really common in women who are pregnant. And after the women have delivered the baby, the symptoms tend to get better. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they come back later in life. But for a lot of women with pregnancy-related carpal tunnel syndrome, once they deliver the baby, things start to get better. Another question in the back. So the question is, does it instantly go away or does it take its time after, after the carpal tunnel release surgery? For most people, it gets better pretty quickly. Um, and then a lot of people will say after, particularly if it's really bad to start out with, they may get slow improvement for six months after surgery. But most people notice pretty dramatic improvement right away. Yes. So the question is, when adults have babies, do they have carpal tunnel syndrome? Sometimes. Sometimes pregnant ladies, pregnant moms, can get carpal tunnel syndrome, but not every pregnant mom will get it. OK? OK. Let's see. There's another question in the back. There is, yeah. So the. The question is, if a nerve is cut, is there a way to put it back together? So um, let me scroll back. Okay, so this slide. So the bottom, the bottom picture is what an, a cut nerve looks like, okay? And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see where the cell body is. You see that? And on the right-hand side of the screen is the terminal end of the, of the axon. So, and remember we said that the cell body is the manufacturing center. That's where everything is made. All of the proteins, all of the, nerve tra the neurotransmitters, it's all made in the cell body. So if you cut the, if the nerve is cut, like on the bottom, everything on the, on the synaptic end of the nerve will die. So all of those neurons will die because they're not, all of the axons on that side will die because they're not getting any nourishment or anything that they need from the cell body because it's disconnected. But that fibrous tube around it, remember we talked about the perineurium, that fibrous connective tissue around the outside of the nerve, that's just fine. No, it, that doesn't get affected. That's not part of the, the conducting apparatus. So if a nerve is cut, you can take that sheath, the perineurium, and you can suture it back together. The axons on the cell body side send out these little feelers. They're kind of looking for a place to grow into. And after you've connected the tube again, the axons will grow back into the tube on the synaptic side, and they'll use that tube as a conduit, and they'll grow down the tube until they get to the very, until they get to the very end, where, wherever it is that it, that it belongs. But that happens at a very slow rate. So nerves grow, an axon will grow at the rate of one millimeter a day. So does everyone know how small a millimeter is? It's pretty tiny. And so they're about 25 millimeters in an inch. So we say that a nerve will grow roughly an inch a month. So if you cut a nerve at your elbow and it's got to get all the way down to your hand, that's probably about 18 inches. So if you cut a nerve here and we fix it, it may be 18 months, a year and a half before we know has it, has it taken. Lots of questions. Go ahead. Right. So, so she asked, so the, the part of the nerve on the opposite side of the cell body, she clarified that that dies, and it does. 
And then she asked, does it die immediately or how long does it take? It doesn't die immediately. It takes a few days. It takes two or three days. Yes. So the question is, when a nerve cell dies, does it cause other nerve cells to die? It doesn't. So if a nerve cell dies, it doesn't have any effect on other nerve cells dying. Uh, the, other nerve cell, the other nerve cells won't be affected by that. So the, the nerve in general, if it's just one nerve cell, the whole nerve, because remember, the nerve is all of these little nerve cells that come together and you end up with this, this big nerve that has several million nerve cells in it. So if just one nerve cell dies, the whole nerve is probably going to be okay. Sure. Mark, we can take a couple more questions. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, think about it. Let's see. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Who's, you haven't asked a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, if, if the nerve dies, does part of it die or does the whole thing die? And so I think it depends a little bit on why, the, why there's been an injury to the nerve. So if it's because the nerve is being compressed for a long time, then it can make the whole thing just die and not work. But if it's because it's been cut or something like that, then it's just a part of it. Go ahead. So the question is, so I, can I generalize it a little bit? So the, the question basically is, if you cut a nerve, will it heal without doing anything about it? Is that kind of, is that right? Yeah. And, the, and the answer is no, it won't. So if you cut a nerve, it needs to be repaired. Go ahead. So the question is, if you cut a nerve here, what side do things die on? So the cell body is in your spinal cord. So that's kind of on this side. So the nerve on this side is OK. The nerve on the distal side is the part that gets affected. OK, we'll take the questions in the second part. We need to conclude this. It's 8 o'clock. Couple things that the next session is going to be in the high school. Please do not come late. We are expecting the auditorium to be full and you may have to go home just because there is no space. When we had Dr. Squires here last time, this auditorium was full. So this time we have moved it to the high school. So coming late will not help you. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I'll appreciate if you come prepared. Study what Dr. Uh, Squires has done or what the rovers, uh, rover on the Mars is. I think that will help you enormously in understanding his presentation. It's going to be an absolutely delightful presentation, so come prepared. Um, as far as those who are here first time, remember there is part two. So if you, have, if you did not get a chance to ask questions to Dr. Wilczynski, you have got a chance. And he also is going to be covering another uh, PowerPoint presentation that he was not able to cover here. So there's going to be some additional new information particularly those who are thinking about this kind of a field as a career, you may want to listen to him. Um, those who are here first time, there should be cookies or some, some refreshment. And uh, whether you go to the part second or not, doesn't matter. You have earned a cookie, enjoy it. Um, so I want to conclude this particular session. And um, I really hope that you all enjoyed it, particularly the question and answer se session with Dr. Wilczynski. I myself learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot here as well. And uh, we do need to make sure that we appreciate his time to come here and educate us about the science of nerve. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
so th this part is concluded. Uh, the second session, the, uh, part two, will start in 10 minutes. Enjoy the cookie in the meantime, and if you don't attend part two, remember November 2nd. Thank you. <laughs>